Good evening, everyone. As uh, as our voice of God just alluded to, I am Patrick Garrigan. I'm the executive director at Atlantic Live. Uh, and on behalf of the Atlantic, I want to thank you all for joining us here this evening. We are delighted to have you for this conversation on artificial intelligence and its implications for our future. To anyone watching the news these days, it seems an intelligent future is coming sooner than we may have even thought. Uh, a robot can play Go, uh, the hardest game in the world. I'm not familiar with that, so I can't speak to that firsthand. Uh, but it can uh, play that game and beat the best player in the world. Cars on the road today drive themselves, and they make the potential for fatal errors less and less every single month. NASA scientists have used AI to discover two distant planets, ones that have eluded human experts for hundreds of years. Beyond these flashy, science, fiction-inspired innovations, AI has much more mundane purposes, simplifying our lives. From our emails, to banking, to healthcare, artificial intelligence is fundamentally changing our existence in more ways than any of us could have ever dreamed. Tonight, we'll hear from three experts who are working on the cutting edge of this technology and are boldly engaging with the emerging significance of AI for both our communities and our world. But before we begin tonight's conversation, I am simply delighted uh, to meet Jeff Brown uh, and uh, introduce him to you all this evening. Jeff is the Vice President of Fidelity Investments Artificial Intelligence Center of Excellence at Fidelity Wealth Management. Uh, so we're delighted to have him here. F Fidelity is, of course, tonight's underwriter, and we are incredibly grateful for, your, for their support, which we would not be able to have this event without that. So with that, I'd like to uh, invite Jeff up here for a moment. Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. We're delighted you could come out uh, despite the inclement weather. Um, when I was asked to make some opening remarks for this event, uh, I was thrilled. I, I, I thought to myself, this is great. I get to talk for a half an hour about AI, and I was told you have three minutes. <laughs> so um, I will be here tonight, as well as our representatives, to talk to you about what we're doing, and we can discuss AI at any level uh, that you see fit. I'd like to thank The Atlantic Magazine for co-sponsoring this event. I'm delighted to be here, glad you're here, uh, as well as our panel luminaries who will speak in depth to some of the more complex topics and some of the exciting things happening in this, in this area. Uh, one of the things that I think we'd like to dispel in terms of myths tonight is people look at banks and financial institutions and they see they've been around for so long. And uh, I wanted to share with you in 30 seconds or less some, some timeline highlights so you understand that you know, part of this whole umbrella of AI involves technology, big data, machine learning, a lot of buzzwords that have been thrown around. And um, with Fidelity, technology and innovation has been in our DNA for over 50 years. And I took a look at our timeline and I thought to myself, let's, let's see what we've really done in this area. So going back as far as 1966 uh, or 65, we bought our first computer. And I'll air quote computers, because I'm sure most of you know those took up an entire floor. And that was a pretty bold decision. And starting with Edward C. Johnson II, by 1970, 1974, we had voice-activated stock ticker prices online. I think in 1985, they were handing out floppy disks so you could directly trade electronically with Fidelity. And they were very, very pro-technology and pro-innovation. I won't give you my age, but around the time I was in high school, which is pretty shocking. And so when you look at our timeline, it's, it's pretty amazing to think that all of the components that now roll into the, the, the whole topic of AI, we've been doing and executing on for over 50 years. Uh, most recently, you know, in, in 1999, we started the Fidelity Center for Applied Technology. It's an exclusive division in floor that's been doing a lot of the cutting edge research. Um, Abby Johnson funds startups and incubators. So a lot of the activities that we now see in the popular media, we've actually been researching and implementing in, in the firm itself. So that's just a brush, uh, a broad stroke uh, covering of the timeline. And there's, there's many other things I'd love to tell you about. But I promised Patrick and the Atlantic we would touch on some things in terms of what finance and, and what specifically AI is doing in this area. Um, in a nutshell, I can't think of a business unit where we're not deploying and leveraging and, co you know, and collaborating with different business stakeholders on where we can employ advanced analytics. And we've been doing it again for 50 years, fund management, generating alpha, ensuring that you're getting the best experience. Anything that you can think of when you call us 
We have models that run, and, and well, thousands of models that run against clients to help understand, you know, what their needs are. Virtual assistants, you can go online and check those out. Um, and we're also, you know, we have some constraints, and some of our uh, panelists tonight will talk about, you know, the caveats and AI running awry. Uh, but because we're a fiduciary, because we have fin financial obligations, we actually have to be very, very cautious about how we deploy it. So we're always grappling with ethical issues. You know, for example, if I want to protect against elderly abuse, can I build a model that allows us to detect if somebody has Alzheimer's using the voice patterns uh, over the phone? Now, some, so we, we grapple with these issues. You know, is it creepy? Is it protecting us? Is it generating wealth for you? Is it protecting your assets, your family, your customers? And that's the beauty of being kind of in a technology and innovation-centric firm. So I'll pause there, or close there, Again, if you have any questions, feel free to talk to any of the reps in this, uh, in this forum. Again, welcome, and I'll turn it back over to you, Patrick. Thank you so much, Jeff. Um, and thank you again, uh, as Jeff mentioned, to Fidelity Wealth Management for making this evening possible. Now, before I introduce a group of folks who spend most of their waking hours envisioning our intelligent future, I have uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, please silence your phones, but don't put them away. Uh, we want to make sure that you join this conversation on social media. So whether that is Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, we hope you'll, uh, you'll continue this there online. You can tweet at us using the handle at Atlantic Live, and you can participate using the hashtag Atlantic Atlantic Intel Future. Again, that's hashtag Atlantic Intel Future. You know, Henry Kissinger, not always my favorite guy, but nonetheless, Henry Kissinger wrote a piece for The Atlantic called How the Enlightenment, e and How the Enlightenment Ends. And I just want to read you the beginning. It says, three years ago at a conference on transatlantic issues, the subject of artificial intelligence appeared on the agenda. And I'll cut through this. He says, basically, his eyes glazed over, uh, but he somehow didn't get up, and he stayed. And then it caught his attention. Um, he said, the speaker described the workings of a computer program that would soon challenge international champions uh, in the game of Go. And he was amazed that a computer could master Go, which is more complex than chess, on and on and on. And he tells the story, which really, how many of you saw the film, the film, it was like when I started college, in the 80s called War Games? So essentially, you know, later we saw it in terms of Terminator and Skynet, but there is this worry at some level of a dystopian concern about AI and what it may be, while we're also swimming along with all the potential benefits that it can, that, that it can create. So I just want to start out right now um, asking Meredith, uh, who has raised both concerns and talked about the strengths and weaknesses, to just tell us, you know, frame for us how, what is the appropriate way, given where we are, and you know, what we just heard from Jeff, I mean, it's here, we're with it. It is dealing with fraud and identity uh, issues and uh, improving health analyses. And so a lot of people not, may not know that AI and machine learning and machine intelligence, the internet of everything and things is already here. So, so frame for us what our equities are that we should be most worried about. Oh, that's a good question. What should we be most worried about? Uh, so I like to uh, think about what we can do with artificial intelligence versus what we should do with artificial intelligence, uh, which I think Jeff alluded to uh, in, his, uh, in his introduction. There are lots of things that we can do with computers, but we often should not do them because they are uh, socially irresponsible. Um, I would also say that uh, apropos of Skynet, one of the things that I like to talk about is uh, the difference between, um, oh, do we have Henry Kissinger, uh, Henry Kissinger <laughs> talking there? <laughs> he wanted to join the panel. <laughs> talking, Alexa yeah. is with us. Um, yeah. Who's um, listening? <laughs> go ahead, sorry about that. That was completely Someone is always <laughs> listening. <laughs> that was Alexa's Freudian slip. Jeff Brown loves that, yeah, it was, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, so. When we're thinking about AI, often we get these Hollywood images in our heads, and that's really normal. Our brains kind of confuse uh, stories and reality. But there's a difference that computer scientists talk about. We talk about the difference between general and narrow AI. General is the Hollywood stuff, that's the Terminator, that's Skynet, and then narrow AI is what we have. And it's all purely mathematical, it's this gorgeous, gorgeously complicated math uh, that you can barely wrap your mind around. But it's just math, and we don't have to be scared of math, 
right? And there are limits to math and there are limits to what we can and should do with it. So I think that's a really good way of thinking about AI, what we can and should do, and also that current AI is math. Yeah, and maybe I can yeah. jump in. Please, Kristen. Yeah, you told us yeah, to. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, I would just also say that as businesses are thinking about applications and how it impacts their customers, there has to be such an alignment between the business side and the technology, and they really have to assess the risks. So an example might be, um, and I work in visual recognition. Our company uh, specializes in that, so I'll, I'll use an example related. But if a, a picture of a piece of lingerie may be completely appropriate for um, an online marketplace or retailer to put up for sale, whereas on a children's content site, that might be something that, that isn't. And so there are different levels of risks associated with allowing something like computer vision to decide, yes, that that image can be published without a human looking at it, or no, it can't. So, so I think, you know, I agree that, that there has to be just real alignment and understanding of, of the pros and cons. I think, you know, one of, the, one of the questions before we get to Donna, I, I think, is to, as, as we look at it, and let me just ask another question. How many of you, I want to ask you personally, because that would be unfair. I uh, don't want you to disclose things. We'll follow the fidelity model. Don't disclose anything you want. But do you know someone who has had their identity ripped off, uh, who has had been uh, uh, essentially uh, had privacy invaded or something like this. And I would, I mean, I, 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 I put your hands up if you know someone. So, so it's significant. I mean, I, 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 I raise this because Eric Schmidt, we were talking about this in the green room, uh, the former chairman and CEO of Google, um, then executive chairman, said last year, he, he, we did a talk, I interviewed him on artificial intelligence and how he thought, now we, this was both you know, the good and bad, but I said, how do you think society is going to be seduced into accepting AI and the concept of AI more overtly, because it's already here? And he said two ways primarily. One, uh, much better health outcomes. So the application of health to diagnoses and other sorts of things in terms of crunching down uh, the incredible vast error rate. So AI would be there. And the second is in the financial sector services where uh, fraud, uh, identity theft, and, and these things. And, and so I just want, you know, when you think about those people who had identity theft happen, if, I hope it hasn't happened to anyone in the room, um, they are willing to almost do anything for that not to have happened. So how much, you know, in the world in which you're at, and then we're gonna get to you, uh, do these very compelling applications um, drive the day more than the con potential concerns about Terminator? So I can give an example um, related to one of the benevolent uh, use cases for healthcare. One of our customers, a French company called Eye Inside, specializing in ear and throat disease. One of their missions is to be able to serve potential patients in areas where maybe there's not um, internet connectivity. So they, they tend to do a lot in Africa and other parts of the world like that. And they basically trained a model um, that is part of a mobile device that they use on an iPhone so that they're able to go into these regions and diagnose with 90% accuracy ear disease and serve many, many times more patients than, than uh, they ever could if they didn't have the technology to help them do that. Dan, in your firm, Human Ventures, which you know I know it's a human-focused uh, set of companies that you're trying to support across a portfolio, but I know that many of them are, are jumping into the AI. So what are the trends that you're seeing on the front end? So we see AI really driving what's happening in, in startups and in technology, just like internet used to, right? Yuval Noah Harari says that technology is not deterministic, so it does not decide whether it's being used for good or bad. We are. So at Human Ventures, we focus on understanding how we build in AI and technology responsibly into every single portfolio company and every single venture that we take on. And what does that look like, right? So we like to discuss something where we feel that um, harnessing the power of AI should be just as important as harnessing nuclear power globally. Because the effects of it, both good and bad, that we're going to have, whether in healthcare, whether in finance, whether in jobs, whether in marriage, um, are going to be very similar to how we see internet 
now versus at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, so this is a, an ongoing conversation that we have with every single application of AI, but we don't have all the answers, especially when it comes to responsibility. So what if I decided to take your company on and I went to say, I don't know, South Korea or Indonesia and set up a company called Android Ventures to take on human ventures. And, and that my, uh, my leverage that I saw was doing exactly the opposite you were, that where you were looking at ethical guidelines and looking at how we shape this, and this is what you know, the CEO of Microsoft is, says, you know, we can design the algorithms to this, but what if I basically say, you know, I'm not gonna worry about that and we're gonna create a more ruthless uh, and less controlled and constrained algorithm um, and, and try to take that to the marketplace. Who wins? So by Android Ventures, you mean Cambridge Analytica? <laughs> <laughs> So here's the thing, who wins? We can look at it short term and long term, right? Short term, yeah, there's always benefits to using technology in a bad way. Hopefully long term, there aren't, but it's up to us to, to make those decisions. Financial gains short term, yes, you're gonna have those. However, this is, this is exactly the time when we're seeing AI impacting not just purchasing decisions, but political decisions. This is the time where we have to come together and, and start putting together legislatures and norms around this globally, just like we do with climate change. This is not an individual country problem, just like the internet is not an individual country solution. Right, Meredith? So I wonder if it would be, uh, I just started thinking about this today, I started thinking about, is it useful to frame it as corporate social responsibility? Right, so we think about corporate social responsibility in terms of the environment. Uh, what are corporations doing uh, in terms of their environmental impact? And I wonder if we should think about AI in the same way. So what are the values that we're embedding in the computational systems that we build? And how can we make sure that our uh, AI systems reflect the values, the positive corporate values that uh, that we want our companies to be putting out there. So one of the uh, one of the exercises I like to do when I'm thinking about a new technology is I like to think, what could possibly go wrong, right? And so I think about this uh, regarding self-driving cars, for example. Uh, self-driving cars are using a lot of AI in their various systems. And uh, there are a lot of things that can go wrong. There are a lot of ways that self-driving cars can kill people and can injure people. There are a lot of things that can go wrong inside the small social community of a self-driving car uh, when you have strangers thrown together. So you need to think about what could go wrong? What kinds of risks uh, is your company exposing itself to? How are your customers going to feel if they discover that you're doing something that they think is creepy? And you kind of have to balance that. I'm such a cynical person as a journalist that I'm drawn to that. But I'm, I want to turn it on its head for a minute. What could go right? I mean, if you looked at the questions of what could go right, and I think any uh, econometrician would tell you that at, for those incidents would be dwarfed by the number of lives saved, uh, the accidents that didn't occur, that a lot of the other things that happened, you know, you know we're hearing um, uh, you know, somewhat anecdotally right now about uh, some of the early incidents of driving. So I'm just wanna have you argue the other side as well that can't you stumble into something that actually the, the aggregated social benefit is so enormous that the minor incidences are just pale in comparison to what we used to have before. Totally possible, not the case with self-driving cars, but absolutely possible. Kristen, what do you think? You've scaled so many of these these companies, and I know this is your your job uh, to sort of look at how you scale it, scale it safely. But I am interested in I, I'm how do I I'm talking too much here, but but Meredith's idea of corporate social philanthropy honestly doesn't appeal to me that much because then you're dependent upon philanthropy to achieve uh, big outcomes. Where most often, if you can deny, de, you know, define the business, the incentives, and move things, you're moving 99% of something rather than the 1% that wants to be decent. So I'm interested in how, because you, you do scale in a kind of ruthless way. So how do you uh, see this? Yeah, well, I mean, I definitely um, look at it as the glass half full and think that there are significant benefits that um, AI can bring to businesses operationally, to um, societies, uh, with health, with uh, smart cities. 
But I think that you know you do have to think about a company like Facebook, who has more users than any one country in the world, and how much power they have if something is falsely um, pushed out through their network. And um, you know, I think that if I had to think about other technologies as they've come to market over the years, you know, if you think about email and spam, that you know hit everything and it was a huge problem. And then technology solved it. So I guess maybe you know the future is about finding ways that technology can actually help solve and detect some of the some of the false uh, things that are that are yeah, you getting used pushed to work out. at Google, right? Yes, I did. Are you allowed to talk about Google? Of course, publicly? yes. Okay. So, so what do you think about this Google decision to, well, maybe it's not a decision yet, but the Google tilt that it may, you know, tweak searches in such a way that it complies with censorship requirements inside China. I mean, that's another part of our automated world. Or, you know, I'm thinking here right now when we're talking about many of you have done worked on facial recognition. So, you know, you get a, a, a jaywalking ticket in China. They, they have facial recognition. They, you know, basically take a demerit on your social standing and kick you out of the party or something. But uh, I, I'm just interested in, in, in that side of that, that as you look at the Googles or the sort of large uh, sides of this, it comes down to norms and ethics again in how they play differently in different terrains. And does that worry you? Well, I mean, Google's mission is always be, you know, don't be evil. Um, and so I think that it's been harder for them as a company and a business that scaled so globally um, and is doing so many different things in different markets. I, you know, I can't by any means speak on behalf of them anymore, but I think that these are decisions that are difficult ones to make. And I don't know that there's any one set of rules that can be applied to every situation. What do you think about the international scene? Oh, I think we're getting to a point where whether it's Google, Facebook, applying it to China or not, it's a little, a little bit Orwellian. So I think that Big Brother is around and we, we have to control it. Now, I'd like to switch it to the AI view that's a little less sexy and less controversial. But AI, going back to your initial question, it's a beautiful, powerful tool. So one way that I'm seeing it impact our lives every day is how it impacts our decision making, right? Um, so think about how you used to have to memorize so many phone numbers and know how to get everywhere and read maps. And uh, there's so many things that we don't do anymore today because we have AI at our fingertips. So what does that mean? One way you could look at it is that we're becoming dumber. Mm -hmm. Another way you can look at it is that we can now use our creativity and power to do more high-end thought processes than memorizing a bunch of phone numbers. Um, so I think it's beautiful going back to how we're applying it to health. We are at a point now where we're seeing less and less death uh, from, from health issues. And AI doctors are becoming better than human doctors. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with jobs, finding the right job, finding the right movie to watch. Mm -hmm. um, let's look at, at the beauty that comes with how AI is impacting our decision making and kind of delve into that, but responsibly. Uh, Meredith, she gave us the pretty picture. <laughs> We all want pretty pictures, yeah. don't we? Uh, it's, uh, it's nice to look at the uh, pretty pictures. Um, one of the things I talk about in my book is, uh, is the notion of, uh, of positive asymmetry, which is where we want to look on the bright side and we don't really want to look at the dark side. Um, and I think when we're, uh, when we're confronting AI, when we're confronting something that has such enormous uh, large social impact, we do really need to look at both and we need to... Uh, we need to look at it with more nuance than we're used to. We're kind of used to this narrative of, oh, we have one problem and we can solve it, and there's going to be like one artifact that's going to solve this problem, and then everything's going to be sunny. Like, it's a lot more complicated than that. Life is really complicated. Um, and I'll also tell a uh, I'll also tell a story about phone numbers. Um, I was I was super into the idea that I don't have to memorize phone numbers anymore, except then my kid was in kindergarten. And he came home with a really bad report card because one of the uh, one of the things that the kindergartners got evaluated on was kid knows their home phone number. 
And I was like, well, nobody told me, and we don't have a home phone. So how is he supposed to memorize his home phone number if, like, if he doesn't have one? So there are lots of ways in which the ordinary world has not really caught up to the high-tech world. So we actually have to make sure that, uh, that we're solving for all of the cases, right? Like we can't have our world be so fundamentally out of sync. You know, one of my favorite articles that The Atlantic ran a few years ago was by Hannah Rosen called The Wired Child. Uh, and it was about her child and interacting with her child, always on games, always sort of, you know, and basically seemed to interact with the world in a very different way, but understood uh, programming and understood what could be done uh, in that world so much better than her generation and, and, and her husband's uh, world. And who are always writing about these things. And I said, maybe we should let the kids write the articles uh, instead of us. But I am interested in whether or not we are suffering from a little bit of generational bias in terms of some of our fears of what's coming next. You know, and maybe the phone numbers is a good example of that. Uh, but I have to tell you, you know, that, that you know, as I look around it and I look at the way cities are redoing themselves and reorganizing and how we see sensors coming into so many pieces of this, or I like when I get into my uh, financial accounts, et cetera, that I am warned about uh, efforts to penetrate them, which have occasionally happened. So all of that stuff 20 years ago, 10 years ago, didn't wasn't really happening. It's come in. So I, I guess I'm just trying to balance it out a little and ask, you know, on, on a generational level, are we going to see something when some of us slip a little bit out of the positions we're in now, we have a very new generation, whether this will become, just by generational design and the way kids have been raised, um, much easier for, for society. Kristen? Well, I think the next generation, I mean, they have come into a world where privacy is pretty much, you know, for the most part, given up. I mean, uh, you give so much information in everything you do, whether it's buying something at a retail store or joining a social network that it's, you know, and you give it willingly. Um, I think that's something that at least my generation, you know, crossed over in terms of uh, getting comfortable with that, I guess. But I think the, the next generations, that is just kind of a given from, from where they start. I want to ask you one thing, Chris, because I, I like to look at people's tweets. And you wrote uh, this really great tweet. Um, she says in parentheses, I'm not on the market, but <laughs> <laughs> there are so many ways that visual recognition Hashtag AI can improve the experience on dating sites. So tell us more. Yeah, so um, so that was, a, I think, in relation to one of our customers, a case study, um, a dating site out of uh, Canada. And, you know, one of the challenges that dating sites have, similar to online marketplaces and social networks, is that people try to put up... Um, inappropriate profile pictures. Um, and obviously, if you're searching for the perfect soulmate, you don't want to be uh, served up a um, offensive picture. And so, you know, I also have written a couple of blogs recently on on moderation, and, and it's a really great use case for computer vision. It does it very well, and it, and it makes the, you know, the internet safer for all the users that, um, you know, that experience it, so. Let's talk about some practical applications out of this, and you talk about moderation, and you mean moderation in terms of what people post, or in terms of, you know, trying to, you know, uh, uh, I guess, bring back some of these extreme comments that, that are out there. I mean, that's very interesting to me, because we do struggle with that um, a lot. But what are some of the other interesting applications that you see out there that we may not be exposed in your crystal ball looking in the future? What are the, some of the other areas so that this may be useful? One of the very exciting parts that I'm looking at is how biometrics is influencing decision making, right? So. Um, just in the past couple of months, Fitbit decided to give their data to Google, right? So Fitbit measures how you react to anything. Technically, yeah, they measure your heart rate and how well you sleep, but if you connect it to any type of device that knows what type of content you're consuming, then it can tell you in real time how you're reacting to content, positively, neutrally, or negatively. You're likely to buy or not. 
uh, in real time. So if I'm walking by a billboard, because there's still billboards out there or online, right? So now I can correlate all of that data with where I am, exactly what do I search for, what I buy, and all the information Google has. So what does that mean now? now so that isn't that Cambridge Analytica? It's actually not, surprisingly. That is just the data, right? And the data is there because we trust all of these different platforms to give them our data. We trust our uh, Fitbits, we trust our Alexas who listen to us, we trust all these different things that are in our homes and in our work. That's just part one, gathering of the data. Part two is analyzing it. How that's getting more and more sophisticated with AI, but you know, I argue that we're so far away from where we're gonna go. I feel like instead of AI, we're more like IA, intelligent algorithms, because I don't think that we got to the point where it's making decisions by itself to, to drive. Um, to drive purchasing behavior. Now, the way that information is getting applied, right? What I'm going to buy, what I react to, what my treadmill habit is, uh, that is all up to the companies buying it and using it, right? So Cambridge Analytica sold it to the highest um, payer. Um, same thing with Google is using the same data to make us healthier. So it's it's a little bit up to who's using it. So Meredith, let me ask you a question and, and take this one step further. Um, we did a thing at the MIT Media Lab, what, two weeks ago, I think, on humanity and technology. I interviewed a guy named, I think it's Nir Ayal. I apologize, Nir, if I'm uh, butchering your name. Uh, he writes the blog Far and Near and Far. And he wrote the book called Hooked. And it's about algorithms and, and all sorts of practices that the social media companies have used to sort of hook behaviors. I keep dropping all this. You're wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and I, I'm sort of interested in how he and other people looking at social behaviors and looking at our performance and looking at how machines and data sets are understanding who and what we are and getting us hooked into things that may be um, uh, negative, how that can be turned around positive. How do you get, you know, to take a fidelity case or something, how do you uh, tweak people to save more as opposed to spend more? How do you get people to uh, look at you know, lifetime savings or, you know, other kinds of questions more. And I'm wondering, you know, again, on the positive side of the ledger, do you think there are things that we've learned in terms of what Donna just shared with us that would be applicable in terms of creating and constructing, socially engineering, if you will, uh, a more constructive set of behaviors that would be socially helpful? So one of the things I write about in my book is an idea I call techno-chauvinism, the idea that uh, technology is always the highest and best solution. Uh, and I think we're at a point where it's not automatic. The technology is always the best thing in every situation. It's far more nuanced than that. Um, so I would say that uh, a really interesting idea that uh, that actually I also heard about at the last at the humanity and tech event uh, is a company called Atapika, uh, run by a woman named Laura Gomez. And what she does is she uses AI to predict the race and gender of job applicants. Now, you hear that and you think, oh, well, you know, this must be some sort of technology for you know, excluding people. No, it's actually technology for including people. So especially in tech hiring, there tends to be uh, a lot of bias if you just train the models to uh, look for the uh, applicants who look like the people who are already successful in your company, right? So if you look at the top echelons of American corporations, they all tend to look the same. And so if you train the model on your data, the model looks at, okay, who's successful? What's their pedigree? And then it looks for resumes that look like that. Well, then we just end up getting, you know, affluent Ivy League educated white guys who are awesome by the way, uh, but we, like, the world is a much more diverse place than that. So what this technology does is it looks at your applicants and sorts through the resumes and gives you a more diverse applicant pool, right? So this is a really good application of AI tweaking us toward the social goal that we want. But it's pushing back against techno-chauvinism because it's saying, well, if we just do the easy AI solution, then we're not actually gonna get to the better world. We need to complicate the AI solution. We need to say, 
what are the problems we know exist in the world already, and how can we solve some of those problems to have a more diverse, representative applicant pool when we're hiring for big jobs? Have any of you heard of Launch Code? So Launch Code, uh, any of you in the audience heard of Launch Code? No, it's interesting. Well, I'm going to do a little advertising for them then. Uh, Launch Code was cr uh, created by Jim McKelvey, and Jim was a co-founder with Jack Dorsey of the uh, company called Square. And, and what he saw was a lot of people who had had some speed bump in their life. Maybe they'd done jail time or they, you know, had a health problem that was, you know, something that, you know, basically, you know, that you needed to work around, uh, perhaps disabled, et cetera. Or, he, you know, what he often said is that people were trained very badly in one of the St. Louis schools in coding. And so he created essentially a coding academy uh, for all sorts of people. And he turned them into, you know, gold star, uh, world-class um, coders and then found that because the resumes somehow had some glitch in the eyes of a human resource department officer, human beings looked at this, that they were very risk averse and they wouldn't hire these people. So they were going through. So Jim began using his semi-celebrity and going out and shaming uh, companies that were not hiring these folks and said, these are the best coders in the world. Why aren't you willing to do it? And he's placed Little, I mean, just thousands of people now, and they've got it in Miami and St. Louis. I know that uh, John Chambers of Cisco and many of the high-tech companies have begun to use this. But it raised the interesting question about human beings and, I guess, you know, kind of widening the aperture for talent and whether or not there are opportunities in the AI arena, also with people who bring those skill sets into it, uh, that we may have something that's a little bit uh, less white guy. Thoughts, Kristen? So, I mean, in tech in general, uh, if you're talking about um, diversity, I think that that's a challenge that every tech company is, is looking to face. I think when you uh, think about training models specifically, um, if you think about training a model in computer vision to make sure there's no bias, having a, a very um, diverse set of training data is so important. And so it's it's a topic that we take extremely seriously. And we have a data strategy team that, that um, goes through extreme efforts to make sure that the data is very balanced and does testing, et cetera. And there's a whole methodology and process to it. But um, it's- Can you give us examples of things you've had to fix? Yeah, I mean, we we work with our clients all the time, um, and you know that's the biggest challenge that companies have. Uh, not surprisingly, is they've got a lot of great ideas and maybe even a lot of great visual content, but sometimes there's not associated data with it, or the data is such a mess that um, it's it's very hard to analyze it. So, um, so we will use what they have, and oftentimes, if um, we're not happy with the results, we will we will use a human workforce to um, provide additional data or we will do that ourselves and we will always iterate and make sure before anything would ever get launched live that it was, you know, equally agreed upon um, to be balanced. So Donna? Well Here's the thing. What I've seen from AI and employment is, is a little bit of a different story. Um, I remember listening to a TED Talk about the biases that are built in, and I think you've been speaking about this as well, right? Um, so the biases are not just built in in hiring, but it's built in it's way more pervasive. So there is AI that's built to look not just at a resume, but the person's full social profile. And it trained itself, yeah, it trained itself, and this is third party, I've just been watching this, it trained itself to recognize signs of depression or pregnancy months or years before it happens. And it scores the candidate based was on those right? signals. Huh? And was it correct? We were talking Honestly, about Alzheimer's with yeah. Jeff a minute ago that, that, that you can hear from communications mm -hmm. of Alzheimer's. Intel has developed a rug that can monitor how you walk across it and anticipate you having a stroke. Yeah. I mean, it's a weird world we're getting it into, It is. Right? One of our portfolio companies is working on thyroid. Can identify you're going to get pregnant before you're getting pregnant? Apparently. Yeah, it's actually not that hard to predict yeah. when somebody is going to get pregnant. Like, so, there's a yeah. window. Yeah. Like, when, no, you know, no idea between, where this like, 16 was going, yeah. and 40. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, uh -huh. It's not that hard. <laughs> okay. The, they they put in several indicators. Anyways, what still count what, me shocked. <laughs> there we go. Um, 
So, but they inputted that data yeah. and eliminated candidates that scored high on either of those two uh, measures because um, they looked that the ROI of that candidate or that employee would be lower, and it kicked them out of the pool, even though that candidate was very qualified in other ways, shape, or forms, and would have brought so much more diversity into the company. So going back to your tech sho chauvinism, which I think is awesome, by the way, um, there's many other ways that AI can input um, existing biases and also some of the coder's biases into how it makes decisions and makes wrong decisions. That's the thing. We have not yet figured out how to make it, how to get it to make right decisions because a lot of the biases that are inputted are subconscious because a lot of our decision making is subconscious and 90% of it. Um, so I think that's where a lot of problems come in with AI applied without, without a human supervision right. factor. Just before I go to the audience uh, for questions, comments, and whatnot, um, let me just ask each one of you briefly the same question I asked Eric Schmidt. You know, as, as you, if you were to look at how uh, society was going to become more overtly, overtly embrace AI, what would, what would that take? What forms would it take? Donna? Um, for me, it would have to have some sort of uh, guardrails. I think that, first of all, let's face it, we have embraced some, some form of primitive AI. I think we're going to look back in 10 years and laugh about what we consider today AI, which is like nothing. Um, so I think we've already been embracing some of it. When we're talking about like deeply having it impact the way we make decisions, um, the way we make decisions, not just us by choosing what movie to watch or who to date, but our partners or our jobs technically in the future could choose whether we are a good a good fit based on our DNA, right? So I think there's there's we have to implement some rules and regulation in terms of how we apply it globally. Otherwise, we're getting ourselves into the biggest danger that we see. Um, going back to Yuval Noah Harari to wrap to wrap this, um, AI if not if not um, controlled properly, could actually break out potentially the human race into several sub-races. This is one thing that he's been arguing in his That's new book. That's going to be in part two uh, <laughs> next week, same time. Uh, Kristen. Well, I think that like all technology, legislation always lags behind it. So, you know, getting and waiting for um, the guardrails or, you know, the legal implications is always has always been a challenge. Uh, that being said, I kind of go back to your opening remarks about um, just really the benevolent use cases of AI. And I think as we see more and more, especially in medicine and um, in the way that governments are run, um, and I actually read a funny article, well, it wasn't funny, but an article recently where um, the writer from the Smithsonian was thinking about the future, and he said, yes, I would vote for an AI-enabled president. And so, like, thinking about, you know, just different, different things that we haven't even um, thought of is really, really exciting. Meredith? <laughs> Touche, touche AI. <laughs> yeah. Mine was in my pocket. Why are timing. they all going off tonight here? <laughs> um. Well, so I, uh, I, I like the idea of guardrails. Um, I think that's, uh, I think that's very, very important as we go into an AI-enabled future. Uh, and I'm, I'm a professor, so I care a lot about education. I care a lot about. Uh, computational literacy and computational empowerment. I think one of the really important things in, uh, in our AI future is for people to understand what AI is and isn't, what it can and can't do, uh, and when, it is, uh, when it's really important to use a computational solution and when it's really important to have a human element. Right, so we can make the, uh, the world that we want to live in, not a world that is just convenient for machines, but a world that's convenient and pleasant and positive for humans. You know, when I started this and I acknowledged that I was one of the people worried about Skynet, I guess I've changed and shifted given all of your cynical um, takes on this. That I, that I actually, you know, it's, it's interesting that, that when you think about what's needed and, you know, what's coming and what, I, I agree with you, there are big ethical concerns you've got to worry about, but at the same time, someone's got to be going for it, like, manically. 
you know, manic AI, you know, or turbocharged AI in a sense. Uh, recently, I had the privilege of interviewing the, the commissioner for the digital economy in Europe, uh, and they were just on the verge of applying the GDPR. So when you're now being asked about your privacy regulations, this, this is the group that um, did that. And I asked him, I said, would you folks in Europe have ever created a Google or a Twitter or a Facebook? Uh, would you have had, the, given your rules and regulations? And his answer was no, we would, we would not have because we have such a, we worry about the people and privacy first and the technology second. You get the technology right. First. And it raises the interesting question about whether you need a symbiotic relationship between creatives that are out there going to be manically creating capacity and then whether you need regulators to get it right for society. And I just want to throw, not have you answer yet, I want to go to the audience, but throw that out. I was very intrigued with that formulation that maybe the U.S. and Europe in kind of creating some of the tensions we're talking about sort of needed each other in this, uh, that neither would be able to have done it without the other. So yes, right here in the middle. Yes, go ahead, and we're going to throw a microphone to yeah, you. I have a question about dealing with partners that go with <laughs> your gut. You know, they say they want to go with their gut versus the data. When you know for sure the data tells a story that's completely different than the gut, how do you deal with? Are there whole swaths of people down? So the gut versus data. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's hard to deal. Always with that. go with the data. Well, <laughs> yeah. No, and I'm, I, what do you guys think? You want to go first? I think it depends. Isn't that the healthcare? Isn't that the doctor? Misdiagnosing by gut versus the machine and algorithms giving you. Oh, you're, Jeff is saying other way around. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. See, this guy like, knows really, ridiculous. Really? Yeah. It depends uh. on the situation, right? So Do we have our, a mic on this side because we have millions of people watching online and millions of bots. <laughs> uh, yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. Hence why. Yeah. I, I <laughs> like think you're about going. to say yes. it, it can go both ways. I mean, right now, as Donna mentioned, we're in our. Infancy. So give us the last time your gut prevailed over data. Uh, I do consider myself an active trader, uh -huh. um, probably to the point where I annoy my compliance department. Uh. Um, and so I do make intuitional changes. I don't just, or, or trades, not just, hey, I'm getting a signal from Active Trader Pro that I know I should listen to uh. and I know I should follow and I'm probably getting, my, getting in my own way. Interesting. And there are successes there, but that's a trivial example. But for mm. the doctor example, it's, you know, you have a machine... Or, or models that are trained on images, and right. this whole panel is adequately addressed biases. You know, if you're looking for a new type of cancer, you may not have enough images to train right. the model, and it may choose a different diagnosis. So your doctor may be right and bring to bear 30 years of experience, and that's still very mm. powerful, whereas your model may just not have had enough data to get trained adequately to look at that granular case. And that's a challenge within our own firm. We have phenomenal ideas. We partner with a lot of technology companies because we have a very specific financial vocabulary. And I may have 90 million chats, and I might say, hey, I can answer most of the questions our reps right. can, and maybe better. But there may be cases where someone, we get a call, we're like, hey, I want to execute an advanced options trade, right. and we only have a handful of data. So we can't really train a model that's going to know right. exactly what to do. Dan so it's in its infancy, but it can go both ways. Thank you. Dana, or other quick reactions? Gut or data? I completely agree with that. The gut perspective, it goes back to like the beginning of decision making, something I mentioned. 90% of, uh, of our decision making is subconscious. So we're not really using all the data. We're using kind of primitive reactions to make decisions. So sometimes that works really well, especially when those decisions are based on our experience of making those decisions successfully before. Otherwise, it has to be data if there is enough data there. You know, flipping it, if you have the data to make the decisions every day, then you can use your gut and your brain for creativity, which is a value add that AI will not be able to do for a long time. And I know that's a conversation we were having earlier. I think that made you happy. That, that answer there, right? Yeah, I can see you. Yeah, there you go. Okay, yes. Hi, my name is Katie. I uh, do intelligence for a hedge fund. And so first, I like that you guys mentioned that there should be guardrails. Mm. Um, that's really important to me. But if there are guardrails, who do you envision being the governing body of AI? Great, great because question. Because I think that we've had cybercrime yeah. in the works for so many years, and still people are confused about that. Uh, and then I have a follow-up question. I think the world now, we're trying to branch out into so many diverse aspects. But as you were talking about, you know, Netflix says, you love murder mysteries, Katie. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's really weird that I only like murder mysteries. And then it gives me murder mysteries, so then I miss out on maybe documentaries about AI. 
And then is it just setting me down this one path and kind of determining my future for me Mm -hmm. where, you know, someone else with a different background and myself wouldn't cross paths because... Great comments. So, guardrails... That's exactly. Who governs the guardrails? So the way I would look at it uh, is I think we need a body just like we we have guardrails for nuclear power and for climate change. And obviously they're not perfect as we've seen with climate change and nuclear power. However, it is a global entity that has some some sort of a power regulation, number one. Number two, the Netflix um, example. So there's a school of thought that says that um, AI should have like anywhere from like 5 to 20% of its options be completely random to allow you to expose you to things outside of your room because otherwise you're going to get more and more entrenched in the way you think. And that's actually the problem with fake news. The more content you consume online about a specific way of looking at things, a specific subject, uh, the more you get served that and the more radicalized you get in a way, right? So that's kind of what we saw. Meredith, do you have comments on on guard, uh, guide rails governance? Um, so I I would like to volunteer to tell the entire world what they should do about AI. That's uh, that's my idea for the guard rail, for the, the governing book, right? body. That was the book. We yeah. need that. Um, and uh, I'll also say that uh, that the Netflix algorithm is a really good case for looking at the limits of AI, because I have actually reached the I've reached the outer limits of the Netflix algorithm, and it's really boring, all of the stuff that it recommends to me anymore. It's like, oh yeah, I've seen that, I've seen that, like these are all the things I knew about already. So the algorithm is not actually a value add at this point, and I'm at that point as well with my iTunes uh, recommendations, my Apple Music recommendations, um, because I had this six month period where I only played the Hamilton soundtrack. <laughs> and, and I like ruined my recommendations. Like it only ever plays Hamilton for me anymore. And like, I wanna branch out beyond Hamilton, but it just won't let me. And the <laughs> controls are not in there for me to, uh, to train it differently. So I think that's a really good case of what happens when you rely too much on expecting the AI to always be perfect and to always you, replace You should try members. going to buy crate and barrel bar stools. You know, <laughs> I went looking for crate and barrel bar stools, you know, the kind without a back that just sit there. And now I have globally, you know, bar stools. You're the expert on crate with, and barrel. No back. I mean, I'm not the expert. It's just something keeps feeding me that all the time. And I'm desperately trying to kind of go click on other things so it will feed me murder mystery you know, instead or something. Yeah, That's try right. we'll try shopping for boots. Questions. Yes. Stuff. Maria. I want to go back to the uh, the healthcare example and democratizing information and your comments on who owns the data. So right. we were talking about doctors, but really, if the information is out there and available, do we need the medical profession, or can people just self-diagnose? Hmm. Kristen, I'm going to give that one to you. Okay. Yeah, I'm a fan for... Um, there's always a place for humans in the loop, and AI, AI gets better with um, with human input. And so um, I think that you know we like to to see examples where AI can help improve tasks that humans aren't doing as efficiently as they can. And I don't think that diagnosing um, illness is necessary. Like I think there still is room for having a human involved in that just for new diseases that come up uh, to the to the example that was given before and the fact that there's still going to probably be some margin of error even if it's only five or ten percent so we're gonna take these last two right here right here and right here so as a follow-on to that can you speak to the future of jobs and which you think are most under threat with the expansion of ai and you've talked a lot about the human element and complex problem solving what are those human qualities that will not be replaced and will become that much right. more important in jobs of the future? Great question. Jobs under threat, Donna? So I think the the biggest set of jobs that is under no threat is uh, human care for both the elderly and the young. So nursing, anything that has to do with having that human touch just cannot be replaced, right? The information that feeds the care 
So yeah. those are the protected jobs. I think those are the, the protective, jobs. yeah. And I also think creativity um, and the way we look at, at art and creation and storytelling is also relatively protected, not as protected as the actual human touch. But if you think about the global elderly population as well as the young population, those jobs are actually going to come at a premium, taking care of another human being. Um, I see that as protected, but the way I see it is not that jobs are going to go away and disappear. Because let's think about the, the Industrial Revolution, right? Some jobs are going to go away and disappear, which might mean, hopefully, in a utopic world, that we're going to get to do jobs that are more satisfying and more interesting to us in our brains and the way we develop. So that's the hope, but it's not necessarily the So the you're role. saying those 4 million truck drivers that will be displaced are going to be just fine? So... Hopefully, we're going to evolve into something where they're going to be driving something that's less easy to drive than trucks down the road, right? Or they're going to be engineering something that's very different. So I think that there's always the best thing to do is look at alternatives. It might make their lives better and happier if you really try to look at it. But yeah, right now, there's no direct solution. 50 years can be look very different. Guys, I want to keep this conversation going on and on because there's so many little debates we could have right now, particularly this one. But we'll come back. Kristen? I was just going to add that I think that, you know, there will be jobs created as there always are when new technologies come into the world. So if you think about when automobiles came, prior to that, there were no traffic lights. So there was a whole new set of jobs that had to, you know, come and evolve to um, implement traffic lights and a whole traffic system um, around the world. So I think that, you know, there will be opportunities like that with AI as well. I think piggybacking off of that, we have to invest in education and, and how do we transition people from one role to another. Potentially, that might be a, a really good solution, plus a job-creating solution in itself. Earth? Uh, I'm really hoping that journalists still have jobs in the future. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure that will case because you know it, it is fascinating when you look at the writing programs that are being developed and how difficult it is sometimes to uh, distinguish the difference between uh, an LA Times article written by a real human being and an LA Times article written by, I'm saying the LA Times, so excuse me, my friend just became head of the LA Times, so I'm just picking on you uh, in case he's watching this right now. But you know, I do think that all of the, you know, I think it's fascinating to watch uh, lawyers displaced, uh, people in the financial sector displaced, truck drivers are displaced, and my one concern just in my own one editorial comment about yours is history and, and the speed of change is happening so much faster now than at the Industrial Revolution. I think, it, you know, I don't know if we're nimble enough to acquire and do all of that, at least for a certain part of it, which explains part of the political drama that we're seeing uh, in the country. But yes, let's take this gentleman right here and then we'll wrap up. I just, uh, going back to the issue of um, AI and controls or guardrails that could be put on it, rather than thinking about a centralized authority to establish those guardrails, what if each individual established their own guardrails to essentially put a humanistic touch to the control of the data? Like blockchain for AI control? Well, I think... Any thoughts on, in reaction to, uh, let me just add to the question of whether or not you can finally build a literacy uh, and a desire to monitor all the dimensions of one's interface with data, with financial institutions, with your choices, with your browsing histories, so that individuals are taught to be more in control of that and, and, and uh, have it. It's a serious question. You know, I don't know if you guys know it, but there was legislation that, you know, monetize browsing histories that are browsing histories and and you know Jeff Flake uh, was the animator of that uh, interestingly enough so I mean it just raises this interesting question of whether or not you can return something to people or whether that's a very naive thing to do given the fact that most of us want to give away our privacy for goodies I think people should have the choice of owning their own data or selling it but given that the genie is out of the bottle, I think it's going to be very difficult to get there without a centralized, um, you know, body that helps govern that. Um, right now, we don't own our data. Corporations own our data, and they fight over it, and they sell it to each other to drive our decision-making in stores and at polls. 
So I think the way you're looking at it, that we should all own our data and hopefully even monetize it is ideal, but it has, we have to have a big trigger to get us there. And I don't know what that looks like other than a centralized one. Kristen, Meredith, quick last thoughts. Um, I think that I, it comes down to an issue of do we build it from scratch or do we build on something that already exists? And I'm a little tired of building things from scratch and I'm a little tired of doing tech support for my life and for my family's life. So I'm not, so I'm more optimistic about building on what already exists. So we already have things like government, you know, and we already have, uh, you know, a system of governance and legislation and, uh, you know, dispute resolution. So I'm more enthusiastic about using our existing systems to manage data and manage uh, issues around AI than I am about building something else new from scratch and then administering that. You know, just based on like the past couple of decades of experience that we've had. Like Kristen. we know how to do this now. Kristen? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there is some responsibility for companies that are building products. And I think that, you know, these governing bodies, I think over time, whether they're in vertically industry focused or um, specific types of technology, companies will form some type of guidelines that, um, that will at least set some guardrails that may not completely protect everyone's privacy, you know, to the granular level that, that you're saying. But... I mean, I know our our mission is is to accelerate the progress of humanity by improving AI, and so that is something that that is near and dear to our heart. And you know, hopefully, if we do it right, and other tech companies feel the same responsibilities, that you know, the experience uh, for customers and users will you know will play out fairly. So let's play out a little test here for those of you who were AI skeptics. Put your hands up like worried about the future. How many have you have less skeptical and less worried after this conversation now? Oh, so some of you. Okay, and for those of you uh, who were AI enthusiasts uh, and said it's gonna change the world, did I get that right? Uh, put your hands up. Okay, and how many of you are now a little bit more uh, worried? Yeah, the gentleman in the back. Okay, great. So we achieved something. It's not quite intelligence scared squared. One. I can't tell who won, but it was a great conversation. So I want to thank Meredith Broussard. Thank you very much uh, uh, at NYU and author of Artificial Intelligence, How Computers Misunderstand the World. Uh, Kristen Chevis with uh, Clarify uh, and Donna Griffin with Human Ventures. Thank you all very, very much.